Thank you very much for attending. I'm Phil Bones. I'm from the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at the university here. So, I'm suggesting to you that the future for electricity is bright, as you can see. When we say bright, we think of light and colour. A bright light means high energy. And to enjoy such brightness, we've either got to have a source that is sunlight, or we've got to have an artificial source, and that's almost always powered electrically. A bright light is also associated with ideas, isn't it? So smart ideas, and I'm going to be emphasising the smartness in this talk. We need smart ideas in order to use electricity in more and more clever ways and to make sure that this scarce, um, you know, the amount of energy we have is finite and we have to use that appropriately. So here's a silly riddle. How many electrical engineers does it take to change a light bulb? I suggest to you that the answer is none because electrical engineers with a few smart ideas have developed LED lamps such as the one depicted here which last 30 times longer than the average incandescent light bulb. So there's no need to change them, is there? 30 times the average life expectancy of a bulb is almost a lifetime, a human lifetime. So everywhere we look we have electricity working for us. It's easy to find spectacular examples for how lighting's been used, since we're on the theme of lighting. This lantern festival here in Christchurch just a few weeks ago, and just last week, the opening of the Commonwealth Games in Brisbane. Uh, uh, extreme examples of how lighting can be used in wonderful ways, all, of course, electrically generated. Let's take a few other examples. The screens that we use, we, we take these things for granted. There's an enormous amount of electrical engineering and physics and other um, engineering that's gone into uh, the electronics and so on and the devices that are, enable us to see such clarity in the screen. And of course the projectors that you're um, seeing here as well are based on similar technology. The telephone. In 150 years we've gone from something that looks like this to something that looks like that. Some of the basic functionality is the same in the sense of the main purpose for a telephone, but of course we've got all of that extra uh, ability built into the modern devices. That's all electrical engineering. All of that has been engineered over those 150 years. An enormous effort and of course it's continuing. Now in computing, digital computers range from the Ridiculous, I suppose you might say. This is a, a picture of a server farm somewhere in the US of literally millions of different computing devices all working together for some purpose, such as Google's search engines. And at the other end of the uh, other extreme, we can have a, a little microcontroller. A unit, you know, probably the size of your um, little thumbnail in which a considerable amount of power, computing power, is uh, embedded. And in fact, we call this sort of computer an embedded computer because it's the sort of device that's inside a lot of the things we use these days and we don't even know they're there. In the third year of our uh, electrical engineering degree, uh, a lot of students get to program uh, this device to uh, control this helicopter. And New Zealand is right at the forefront of embedded use of embedded systems. It's something we're very good at. The internet. Again, we take it for granted. But this huge array of computing around the world is being used, utilised, in order to get the information we need around the world quickly and efficiently. And that's all been engineered. Software, of course, the apps that operate on the internet uh, have been generated by, typically by software engineers in this case, but working in conjunction with electrical engineers. In the household, the domestic appliances probably seem a little mundane compared to some of those other things I've been talking about. But nevertheless, each of them has to be designed carefully and appropriately for safety and to get the 
functionality we want. Sometimes they build a bit of extra functionality and we probably don't need, but nevertheless, it's all engineered. Robots. Again, I'm taking extremes here. In a car assembly plant such as this one, we've got a whole lot of very powerful devices doing repetitive tasks extremely accurately and reliably, but they're pretty dumb, these robots. But now more and more we're using robots in areas where humans possibly have played the, the main role. So on the left here, this, this elderly lady is doing a lung function test under the supervision of this little robot sitting on a desk. I'm sorry about the quality of that uh, picture. Um, it's possible to have devices within hospitals now that can supplement the human staff and allow people, for example, to have a blood pressure taken um, by means of uh, supervision by a unit like this. And on the right-hand side, it is starting to happen that operations are being performed by robots, usually under human supervision, but that human may be in a different country while the, um, the actual surgery is being conducted. In transport, it's obvious that there's a bit of a revolution going on. It's actually been going for a number of years, but it's, it seems to be accelerating at the moment. This is at a commuter train in Auckland, um, and this is an electric train. Uh, we are getting commuter trains in Christchurch, we've just heard. Um, I suspect they won't be electric initially, but I'd say in the long term for it to be sustainable, they will need to be electric, and I hope that's the case. And cars, we all know that there are a number of electric vehicles in New Zealand now, that's still a small percentage of the fleet, but this is going to grow. At the high end of things is a Tesla, um, a pretty smart and very expensive vehicle. I visited Palo Alto, part of California recently, near, near San Francisco, and there seem to be an awful lot of these cars <laughs> around, but that's just that, that particular part of the world. And the two-legged, or oh, two-wheeled variety, we've of course got the uh, electric bikes that we're seeing around town now, and a number of people are getting these, and there have been a few um, very p powerful, high-performance uh, motorcycles built with electric power as well. So all of these things are around us all the time, and at the heart of all of this is the electron. Electricity is based on the movement of electrons. Now, in order to give those electrons, or to make them useful to us, we've got to give them some energy. So that means generation. And New Zealand has a huge advantage in this area. 55% of our um, generation of, of electric power is due to hydroelectric schemes such as this one at Clyde in the central Otago. And that's a, that is a huge advantage. Another 18% is on other types of renewable energy. And in particular, geothermal. It's not one that people know much about, but at this plant at Wairaki, north of Taupo, is our biggest uh, geothermal unit. And that provides, uh, well, re renewables in general re uh, supply 18% of our power. So a total of 73% is, comes from renewable sources, which is very good. But of course, this power is being generated at dams you know, typically down in the South Island, um, or in this case in the middle of the North Island, where, whereas the power is needed somewhere else, so we have to distribute it. So at the moment, the only cost-effective way of doing that is really by means of these rather ugly towers and transmission lines. They're both ugly, nobody wants them in their backyard, but also they're somewhat wasteful because as the current flows along these wires, it is heating those wires, so we're losing some energy due to heat. So it would be really nice if we could use a superconducting cable instead. So this is a three-phase superconducting cable. It's got liquid nitrogen flowing down uh, in, right in the middle of it and coming back out through the sheath. It's got a cryostat there to keep it cool enough for that, liquid, that nitrogen to stay liquid. It sounds marvellous but it really isn't practical for anything but quite short distances and very specialised uses. Otherwise, this would be marvellous, but it's not a technology that we're probably going to be able to, to use it to any great extent. Now, another source of renewable, of course, is the wind power, these wind turbines. Again, somewhat ugly, 
Um, they're uh, not something that most people want in their backyard. But we can bring that power source much closer to home, of course, with photovoltaic uh, panels, or solar panels as we call them. This has the advantage of the power being generated right where it's needed, but the trouble is it's at the wrong time. The power has been generated during the day when most people want their power in the evening or at night. So there's an extra problem. So to some extent that can be solved or at least um, a, a solution can be found by using a storage device. And this is a very modern Tesla power wall, which you can see looks quite attractive, can be mounted on a wall and uh, provides uh, a certain amount of storage of, of power. And battery technology continues to improve, so there is some help in that regard. So all of these things uh, are working in the, in the right area. They take a lot of smartness, a lot of electrical engineering to make them practical for us to use. And one further one before we leave generation, it is possible to have a micro hydro system in some places. So if you happen to live in the country or you live near an area where there's a stream flowing, in principle it's possible to have a little uh, micro hydro as this cartoon sort of depicts. And that's been around for a long time. Now electrical engineers and computer engineers play a part in all of these developments. They're designing new technologies, tailoring existing technologies to, to our needs, maintaining systems, and also helping people to adjust to the changes that come about when, when, when new technologies come in. Here's some budding engineers. These are 12, year 12 and year 13 students that came into our department a couple of years ago as part of a, uh, a week-long camp. And they are doing various things, various activities in our nanotechnology laboratory, in our a high voltage laboratory, this is the only one in New Zealand that we have uh, in this department, and doing a range of activities. So what are the challenges for these students and for you? Well, I think the biggest challenge we all face, probably many of you would agree, is climate change. So these pictures taken 32 years apart show the polar North Pole ice cap as it was in 1984 and, and more recently in 2016, 32 years apart, and shows how much that ice cap has shrunk. And we all know that there is um, movement in this area. So we're going to have to be smarter again to um, overcome this in various ways. And while I can't by any chance look at all of those, let's look at one particular area. If we're going to be smarter, we need computers which are faster and more powerful. But the trouble is, in order for them to be faster, don't they have to have more power? Back to the server farm. This one is in the States, as I said, and it turns out that in 2014, the server farms in the US used 60 gigawatt hours in that year. Now, that number may not mean anything to you until I tell you that New Zealand, you, the whole of New Zealand used 20 gigawatt hours in that year. So the server farms just in America alone were using three times as much power as ours. That sounds pretty desperate. But on the good side, if we look at a, the trend of that power usage, after about 2007 or so, it has showed to be pretty static. It hasn't gone up much. This dashed line here represents what would happen if we just took all the computers that they kept on installing more and more, and if there hadn't been any improvements in efficiency, that's where the usage would have gone. Instead, it's almost flat. And that's because of efficiency, smart thinking that they've applied to this, both in the computers themselves, the power systems that are generating them, and so on. So people have got smarter. So this is encouraging. You may have heard of Moore's Law, this relates to the amount of computing power per dollar in this case, or per thousand dollars. So calculations per second per thousand is the uh, logarithmic scale up here. And here we've got years from 1900, so this predates the digital computer by a long shot, um, right through to uh, you know, current times. And you can see that we're getting a steady improvement. 
as is predicted by Moore. Now, you can also draw a graph just like this for the amount of computing per joule, so per unit of energy, and that's actually more significant these days, people are realising, as I've said, with those server farms. So, smart thinking again can enable, in this case, better and better computers to be designed even though we're starting to get right down to the limits that seem to be imposed by physics, they are still continuing to get better and better computers. And this, will, this should continue. Now, what do you need to study if you're going to be um, interested in engineering? Well, I think anybody in this school of engineering would agree with me when I say two things, physics and mathematics. An understanding of the physical basis of what makes things work is absolutely fundamental to engineering. In fact, you really could say that engineering is applied physics. That's the way most of us think of it. But just as importantly, the physics tells us what isn't possible. There's lots of people out there with brilliant ideas, but some of them are pretty crackpot, and that's because they don't understand the physics. So it's really important that we have that. The tools of mathematics and they'll enable us to describe the phenomena we can observe, to analyse the relationships between the quantities that we're dealing with, and to, to develop models for how those systems work. And then we can design and understand the systems we build. Now, of course, a lot of other things at school are important as well, and I'm just going to emphasise three, but in particular, English. Probably not one that you'd necessarily think of in the engineering context. Engineers have to be able to communicate. It's vital. So good ability at English is important. The other courses, some schools will offer digital technology and electronics, um, some of the schools that you're at, and those are important. They certainly feed in, of course, into electrical engineering in particular, uh, but they're not absolutely necessary. I think their main role at the moment is probably in motivating some students to come in this direction uh, because they, they get to play with some interesting stuff in the electronics and digital technology and that gives them that impetus. It, it will play a bigger role in the future but at the moment that's my, my feeling on it. Now I've talked a lot about electricity in our everyday lives and now I want to turn to something which is actually might, you might not think of as related to engineering and that's medicine. So I, when I graduated with my BE, I pursued a career in a hospital, in, a, in biomedical engineering, as it's called. In other words, I applied my engineering knowledge to medicine. And you might be thinking, well, surely hospitals are full of nurses and doctors and so on. Yes, they are, but they're also full of equipment, such as this electrocardiogram, pulse oximeter that goes on the finger to work out how much oxygen the uh, body is absorbing from the lungs. Um, pacemakers have been around for a number of years now. In fact, this was the area that got me into uh, interest in me medicine. Um, and they have become extremely sophisticated. Um, people who have them hardly need to, to worry at all about their heart after they've got a pacemaker. It's a marvellous uh, invention. Uh, on the other end, again, cardiac related. Sometimes people collapse on the street or something. Paramedics need to go out with a defibrillator unit, a couple of paddles and so on. And more and more we're seeing in, um, with the workplace um, a, uh, an automatic defibrillator. We've got one just down the corridor, example. And so, again, electronics and electrical and computer engineering being used for a very practical purpose to, and to saving lives. During surgery, uh, surgeons use electrocautery so using electric current to seal off the ends of um, uh, small vessels as they do their operation. And one of the most exciting developments over the last, uh, well, nearly, nearly 50 years now, is the development of scanners of various sorts. And in particular, I want to concentrate on one, the magnetic resonance imaging scanner. And this depicts uh, over a span of 47 years, the original experimental apparatus in Nottingham in, New in England, and a modern uh, MR scanner that uh, various companies produce these days. These are expensive devices, 
but the amount of engineering that goes into them is absolutely phenomenal. So, in principle, the main thing about a, an MR scanner is that it produces a very large, high intensity magnetic field, 75,000 times as strong as the Earth's magnetic field, that's oriented along the axis of the bore of the machine and along the axis of the patient. And that's done by means of a super, a super conducting coil. And of course it's got to have all the cooling associated with that and so on. Um, there are other coils which I'm going to talk about in a minute, but basically the idea is that by interrogating the, uh, the uh, atoms within the body, we're able to make exquisite images, such as this one here, showing a lot of detail in the, f the soft tissue, in this case of the brain, of course. And, um, and typically in operation, we've got, uh, a rather dark, but there's probably a radiologist and a uh, radiographer operating the machine. It takes a lot of skill to operate this machine, but of course a lot of the hard work is being done by the computers and so on which connect uh, to the system and do the processing involved. So, how does it work? Well, the body is made up of a lot of water. A lot of uh, composition of our body is basically water molecules, and water molecules contain two hydrogen and one oxygen, as I'm sure you know. And each hydrogen atom comprises a proton as a nucleus and an electron, a single electron. This is the simplest atom. Now, it happens that this combination um, exhibits a spin, a nuclear spin. And when we put a magnetic field on hydrogen atoms, they tend to line up, <laughs> a little bit like the iron filings line up at the end of this magnet. And this is depicted in this cartoon. We've got a whole lot of hydrogen atoms here. In the presence of the magnetic field indicated by the blue lines, they tend to line up. If we then apply some uh, radio frequency electromagnetic radiation into that body, we can get those various, uh, the spins of those atoms to precess, just like the way a top, the old fashioned spinning top, precesses in the Earth's magnetic field. Now, if this is another cartoon depicting the makeup of the machine, we've got these, this big coil here which is generating uh, what's known as B0, the, the main magnetic field, that's the high, high amplitude field, typically three Tesla in, in terms of amplitude. And then we've got these other uh, coils which are depicted, these sort of rectangular ones here, which are producing a, oh, and circular ones, are producing small gradients in that magnetic field. So it means that the magnetic field at the head is slightly less, say, than that at the feet of this particular person. It, it turns out that that precession that I mentioned on the previous, whoops, that was supposed to go back, that precession that I mentioned happens at a very precise frequency that is related to the strength of the magnetic field. So by changing the magnetic field strength across the body, we can encode all of those spins of those hydrogen protons, uh, hydrogen nuclei, so that they are slightly different depending on the position. And that's what gives the information out about the uh, composition of the body through the system. The radio frequency coil is used to put energy in to exercise that, those precession, get those um, uh, spins uh, in train, and then they echo, they produce a signal themselves, which is again picked up by the radio frequency core, either the same one or in some cases a different one. So all of that requires a lot of clever processing in order to make an image. And here's another couple of examples of images, this time of a knee joint with the cartilage showing up in between the two bones, and here's a, uh, a cross-sectional image, perhaps an unusual cross-sectional in the sense that it's taken this way, down the abdomen of a person. Now, it's possible as well to do what's known as functional imaging. So, MR can be used to find, in this case, the perfusion of the brain, how much oxygen is getting to different areas of the brain at, at different times or under different activities in this case. And this has even led to 
people being able to work out what people are thinking in the sense that they can engage them in some sort of activity while they're inside the scanner and see which areas of the brain light up in terms of getting oxygenated because that indicates that that area of the brain is, is thinking. And here's another newer, uh, quite, quite new uh, technique that's being applied. This is called diffusion MRI. And in this case, the green lines there are showing the, uh, the uh, trajectory of fluid flow within the brain. So this is indicating something about how the fluid flow flows within the brain. It can be used for both for um, uh, diagnosis, but it can also be used for research. So the MRI, this is my last slide of this sort, the MRI represents a huge combination of physics, engineering, particularly electrical engineering, a bit of computer engineering, some electronic, lots of electronics in terms of uh, the precision, lots of electromagnetics, and some software as well, of course, on top. And this is a nice bright image, which I think can return us back to the, to the topic. The future of electricity is bright, I'm suggesting to you. And if you decide to study um, engineering, remember physics and mathematics, this is really important. And if you do decide to study here, you, can, you don't have to make a decision immediately as to which type of engineering you want to do. As you know, there's a lot of different types. Um, you can make that decision during the first year and in fact we find through surveys of students that a lot of students do make their, their decisions quite late. You will have to make some choices um, in that first year of, top, of subjects to take which may influence the range of different uh, disciplines you go into but basically you will have choice during that first year. Thank you very much. <laughs>